Hey, I'm Mike, the solo developer of Exodus Borealis, a city building and tower defense game. Welcome to the third development blog. It's been a busy few weeks. Development has continued at a torrid pace, and I've brought on my first few playtesters. I'm changing the development blog format a bit. I'm going to first go over what's newly developed, and then I'll take a deeper dive into a topic not yet discussed in this blog series. Thus far, I've created two islands. I figured it was time to create a third. Shirori Island, the first island, was created as a big open sandbox. It has a large grass field, giving a huge amount of freedom and space to learn the fundamentals of city building and tower defense setup. The next environment that was created is Kuro Island, a black and green, Icelandic-inspired island. The second island focuses on having the player take what they learned on the first island and learning to adapt it to a more restrictive environment. Now for the third level, Kazan Island. I wanted to draw inspiration from a large volcanic island. Unlike the prior islands which happened to have mountain peaks, I wanted the island itself to be one large volcanic peak that you build on the side of. In addition, I wanted to have more of a vertical element to the city building, giving the player several buildable platform areas. This requires more advanced planning and better logistics to avoid the bottleneck of the Vol Fox's tiny little lakes trying to cover large distances. After several days of experimentation, I was able to come up with a design that looks fairly natural and meets all the requirements I had set up. I made sure to design it in such a way where multiple stages of defense could be set up. Unlike the other two islands, where time is spent mostly inland building, almost hiding the fact you're on an island, on this map, you're establishing a settlement atop large cliffs, where there's a constant reminder just beyond the edges there's a vast ocean. Now that I've gotten past the starting islands, I'm excited for the freedom it gives me in designing future islands. But before I get too carried away, I want to await some feedback from my playtesters before designing the next island. For the tower defense portion of the game, Strategy largely comes from making clever mazes for the invaders to traverse through. The other major aspect of tower defense strategy largely comes from the mining of rare elemental gems, then applying those gems to towers to give them elemental damage. These elemental towers are arranged in such a layout to maximize the elemental synergies, amplifying one another while avoiding negation effects. Up to this point, there's been really two flavors of towers that can be given this elemental damage. Arrow Towers, which are rapid-fire, single-target towers, and Bombardment Towers, which are slower, lower-ranged, area-of-effect towers. Both of these tower types simply attack invaders while they're in range. They shoot over walls and any other obstacles. I wanted to add some more depth to tower placement, so I've now developed a Blast Tower. This tower fires down a straight line, and unlike the other towers, it doesn't stop or detonate when it hits its first target. It continues down the line until it runs out of range. Also, this tower doesn't rotate or shoot through walls or other buildings, so to maximize effectiveness for this tower, it's best to be placed in long corridors along a labyrinth. The nature of this blast tower plowing through any number of enemies makes it particularly effective against packs of enemies, but it can be rather underwhelming when attacking bosses or spaced out invaders. This pro and con nature nicely fits the game rule set that I've already established. I'm continuing to roll out new invaders into the game. The challenge is to add diversity to each of the attacks without resorting to bad feeling mechanics, such as flying which bypasses the maze you work so hard to build. My newest invader type is a demon dog. These dogs are by far the fastest invaders yet, but they are balanced by having less hit points. This makes effects such as stuns and knockbacks particularly effective holding them in place while other towers can do damage. A large part of the city building element of Exodus Borealis is the management of jobs. I wanted to create job management that's simple, not requiring layers of prioritization or heavy micromanagement of individual tasks. I've come up with a system where you simply just assign the number of full fox that you want to work a specific job. So far, I've implemented 12 different assignable job roles, as well as the default general worker role. All the assignable job roles use or produce resources. The default general worker job is different from those and doesn't have an output, but is used for managing logistics. They are important for moving resources from where they are produced and delivering them to where they are needed. 
I also made sure that each job role will do their own logistics work if it is needed. For example, if charcoal's in high demand, and there are two charcoal huts in operation, each being worked by a single charcoal burner, it may be optimal to assign three charcoal burners, having one of those three focusing on stocking the huts with wood and clearing produced charcoal. As logistics is so important to have a smooth running settlement, I made it so that if a worker has nothing to do for their assigned job, they will default back to general worker logistics tasks. In playtesting, I've noticed both testers and myself neglecting the general worker role. By design, I balance the game in such a way where you're almost always pressed to be making tough job prioritizations. As the general worker doesn't have a tangible output, psychologically they don't seem as important and end up often being the job that gets cut. In reality, they are one of the more important workers. Without them, lumberjacks have to store their own chopped wood, miners have to stop mining and clear out their mines output, cooks have to stop cooking, track down raw food and charcoal, and so on. As a developer, I will have to work on a way of communicating how effectively each job type is running, so the effect of not having efficient production is more obvious. Overall, game progress is on schedule. I've now hit my next major milestone of having private play testing. As a result, I find myself spending a little more time on bug fixes, but the testers are a great small group of people. Engagement and feedback has been truly amazing. If you're interested in helping steer the direction of the game, please join my Discord server linked in the description below. I will be soliciting a few more playtest volunteers, as well as continuing to place polls and having discussion about potential developments. Also, feel free to ask any questions or comment below. I'm still planning a early access release midsummer, with the full game being released at the start of winter. If you're interested in the game itself, you can subscribe to this channel for more updates, and you can wishlist the game on Steam to get notified of a release. If you like this video, give it the old thumbs up. If not, a thumbs down might be appropriate. Thanks for any interaction. It's a small one-man studio. It makes a big difference. Until next time.